Baldwin IV had been succeeded by his short-lived nephew, Sibylla's son by her first marriage, Baldwin V. But he had died after only a year of nominal rule. He was only eight when he became king. Raymond of Tripoli and his allies had then tried to prevent Guy de Lusignan becoming king. But their rival candidate, the husband of Sibylla's younger sister Isabella, had proved unwilling, and Guy's supporters had engineered his coronation as king in September 1186. Most of the barons of the kingdom had then recognised Guy as king, even if reluctantly. Only two refused. Baldwin of Ibeland, Lord of Ramla, left the kingdom and went to Antioch. Raymond of Tripoli remained in Galilee and began to negotiate with Saladin for a truce to protect his lands. He only subsequently recognised Guy as king after a Muslim army, which he had allowed to cross his lands, had wiped out a small force, mainly of Templars, at the Battle of Cressel in May 1187. As regent for the kingdom, for the child king Baldwin V, Raymond had already agreed a four years truce with Saladin in 1185. The latter needed his hands free for the final subjugation of his rival Muslims. However, soon after Guy became king, one of his most important supporters, Reynald of Châtillon, Lord of Ultrajordan, had ambushed a Muslim caravan crossing his lands and broken the truce. Guy could not persuade Reynald to offer reparations and apology. Since Reynald had been chiefly instrumental in his becoming king, he was in a weak position to insist. Saladin and the kingdom were now at war. Eventually, in July 1187, Saladin launched a full-scale invasion of the kingdom, and as four years earlier, the two armies faced each other in Galilee. But this time, King Guy decided to advance and to attack the Muslims, even though their army was considerably bigger than four years earlier. The Christian force ran out of water in the arid hills of Galilee and was comprehensively defeated. A thousand of the 1,200 knights in the army were killed or captured. King Guy and most of his barons were captured, as was the relic of the true cross on which Christ had been crucified, which was the standard and symbol of the Crusader kingdom. The obvious question is why did Guy decide to attack the Muslim army, even though some of his own men, including Raymond of Tripoli, advised him to stand on the defensive and to wait out Saladin, as he had four years earlier. Muslim armies only ever fought short campaigns, and their leaders needed to return home during the autumn harvest to raise tax revenues from their lands. Furthermore, since Saladin was attacking Raymond's own town of Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, where his wife was staying, his advice not to go to the rescue, but to stay on the defensive, was, at least outwardly, disinterested. But having agreed to remain on the defensive, Guy was then persuaded by the master of the Knights Templar, Sherad de Ridfor, who apparently had an old grudge against Raymond, to change his mind and lead the army towards Tiberias. But although they could see the Sea of Galilee in the distance, the Franks never reached it. The Muslims surrounded them and overwhelmed them. Some contemporaries and many modern historians have accused Guy of folly in ignoring obvious and sound advice and for leaving his water supplies and fighting a battle in arid territory against a superior enemy force. But while his decision had disastrous consequences, was it therefore foolish or illogical? One might, in fact, well answer no. The reasons for this are as follows. First, there was the precedent of what had happened in 1183. Guy had then stood on the defensive and been roundly criticised for doing so. While we do not know for certain who his chief critics then were, the fact that he had been replaced by Raymond of Tripoli as Lieutenant of the Kingdom suggests that Raymond had been one of them, and probably the leader of the criticism. Now Raymond was suggesting he do exactly what he had been so criticised for doing in 1183. Why? Secondly, Guy was a new and controversial ruler. He had become king as the representative of a faction among the barons, but others had opposed him. 
He had not inherited the throne, but was king through his marriage and through election. His authority was yet weak, and one of his chief barons had refused to recognise him for eight months after his coronation. He needed to assert himself, and a military success would consolidate him on his throne. Third, Guy had no reason to trust Raymond. According to one contemporary source, the master of the temple had said to Guy, will you follow the advice of this traitor? Raymond had profited at Guy's expense in 1183. He had tried to prevent Guy becoming king. He had refused to obey him after his coronation. And his negotiations with Saladin at that time were arguably treasonous. Guy must surely have feared that Raymond's advice to remain on the defensive was a trap designed to undermine his position as king, as it had already undermined his position as lieutenant in 1183. Sherat de Ritfor, the man who advised him to attack Saladin, had supported Guy's claim to be king and had helped to facilitate his coronation. He was someone Guy knew he could trust. Fourth, there was Henry II's money. This, or a substantial part of it, had been lodged at Jerusalem with the Templars. When Saladin had threatened the kingdom, the money had been commandeered and used to pay mercenaries. They would expect to be paid whether or not a battle was fought. The money had been used because the Frankish leaders must have realised that after 15 years in action, King Henry was unlikely ever to come to the East and use the money. But he would clearly be very annoyed at its unauthorised use, and Henry II's bad temper was famous throughout Christendom. The Templars, as the money's custodians, would be the primary focus of his anger. He could, for example, confiscate their lands and his dominions. However, if a battle was fought and won, then there would be a much better excuse for having used the money than if there was simply a standoff and stalemate, as took place in 1183. The master of the temple had therefore good reason to advise that a battle should be fought to justify the expenditure of Henry II's treasure. Any personal dislike he may have had for Raymond was surely secondary. King Guy, too, would want to justify the use of Henry II's money not least to ensure that he might receive help in future from the powerful Kingdom of England. Finally, the King's army had in fact fought and defeated Saladin once before an open battle, in 1177 at the Battle of Montgisard in the south of the Kingdom. Saladin was not invincible, and while he had a large army, some of the contingents came from cities still ruled by Nur ad-Din's relatives, and might not therefore be wholly enthusiastic in supporting the man who had profited at the expense of their lords. And while outnumbered, the Christian army was still one of the largest the Kingdom of Jerusalem had ever mustered. The full force of the Kingdom was there, a small contingent also from Antioch, and a substantial force of mercenaries recruited from Western pilgrims, Armenians, etc. They had won against Saladin before, the Franks did not necessarily expect to be defeated. Thus, although the decision to fight a battle in July 1187 in the event proved disastrous, the reasons for choosing to fight were not necessarily foolish. There were good reasons why Guy de Lusignan chose to fight a battle. His reasoning may have been flawed, but it was logical. That some of the reasons stemmed from the previous political divisions within the kingdom, and that these divisions played their part in undermining the kingdom, is undoubted. But neither the, as it turned out, flawed decision-making before the Battle of Hattin, or the internal disputes within the Frankish aristocracy that preceded the disaster, can fully explain the catastrophe of 1187. Given the growing unification of Islam, the continuing lack of Western help for the Crusader states and their increasing isolation, the situation of the Franks in the East was growing ever more unfavourable. Combined with the internal tensions within the Kingdom of Jerusalem, these factors undermined its very existence. 
But perhaps most fundamental of all was the demographic weakness of the kingdom. The failure fully to colonise the East and the consequent lack of manpower meant that any military threat was fraught with danger. Raising the Frankish field army fatally weakened the garrisons who had to defend the cities and castles of the kingdom. As one contemporary report expressed it, not a man able to march to war remained in the cities, towns and castles without being urged to leave by the king's orders. So, the consequences of a decisive defeat were therefore irretrievable.